Americans list retirement as their number one savings goal. And most of us think we're not saving enough. We're probably right. About half of American workers aren't putting any money away in their 401k, and only about 30% of workers have saved $50,000 or more. Less than half have even tried to figure out how much they need to save for retirement. Most workers think they'll need about $500,000 to live comfortably in retirement. That may be too low for some workers, and it may be too high for others. In this lecture, I'll try to demystify the retirement savings process. Let's start out by talking about what retirement is. Most of us have an idea of turning a certain age and walking away from our job into a life of bliss. But in order to understand why we should save for retirement, I think it's important to first think about why we even want to retire in the first place, and what a good retirement age is, and what we ought to do when we retire. Old age income benefits through Social Security were intended to keep citizens out of poverty in later life. When Social Security was created, the average American died about 10 years younger than the average American does today. In fact, one of the most consistent findings in science is the rise in longevity that's occurred in most advanced countries. We gain a little more than a year every decade in longevity after the age of 65. Unfortunately, while we're living longer, which is a good thing, we continue to look to Social Security to tell us when to retire. The first year of Social Security eligibility is age 62. Care to guess when most Americans start taking Social Security? About 40% take it as soon as they become eligible. That number was over 50% a few years ago. The recession that began in 2008 may have caused many Americans to consider delaying Social Security, but I think that more Americans should consider a later retirement date. First, they're going to live longer. A married couple age 65 has about a 45% chance that one of them will live to age 90. And those whose income is over the median will live even a few years longer than that. If we live longer, it makes sense not to rely on Social Security eligibility ages that were created decades ago. These retirement age thresholds created by Social Security trigger what's known as an endorsement effect. Being, being eligible makes us think that the government has endorsed this early retirement age. But it really is just a random number. We should retire when it makes sense for us. We do find that wealth consistently leads to greater happiness in retirement, but only up to a point, around $4 million. Beyond that point, it can become a burden to manage your wealth. And income makes people happier, but income drawn from savings provides less happiness than income from a pension or from Social Security. There's a good reason for this. People tend to feel like it's okay to spend money that comes in a monthly check, but they don't feel comfortable spending money out of savings. And it appears that those who accept retirement as a different and new life stage are happier than those who try to hang on to their previous life. Moving to a new location and starting a new life with abundant activities and social interactions seems to be the best strategy. So let's start out by thinking of retirement as a new life stage, and our financial goals should match what we want to do and when we want to retire. Obviously, doing more and retiring earlier will be more expensive. Let's think about what it means to have a more expensive retirement. It means that we'll have to save more during our working years. We'll have less money for things like vacations, children's education, improving our home, or replacing a car. That retirement savings trade-off is the essence of life cycle finance. Your goal is to balance spending right now with spending in the future. 30 years ago, retirement was about having a party, getting a gold watch, and drawing a pension. 
That all changed in the 1980s. Companies started using the little-known tax code section 401k as a substitute for the traditional defined benefit pension. This was great for companies. They could get rid of the cost and the risk of having to manage a pension. It also gave employees the freedom to build their own retirement income. That increase in personal responsibility means that retirement is what you make it. We can make it a lot worse by saving too little or investing badly. Or we can make it better by saving the right amount and investing wisely. The good news is that it's not as hard as it seems. The first step is to decide on your income replacement rate. In other words, how much of your pre-retirement income do you want to spend each year after you retire? The income replacement rate comes directly from the life cycle consumption smoothing concept. A simple retirement income plan would maintain our standard of living after retirement. Most of us don't spend 100% of what we earn every month. First, part of our income goes toward retirement savings, or at least I hope it will after you hear this lecture. If we save 10% of income every month in a 401k, then that's money that never makes it into our paycheck. If we earn $5,000 this month and save $500 for retirement, we've only got $4,500 left that we can spend. Our replacement rate is now down to 90%. So what other expenses do you have now that you might not have in retirement? Let's consider a mortgage. Most new retirees, even most older baby boomers, have paid off their mortgage. If you're paying 15% of your income now towards a mortgage, that's an expense you probably won't have in retirement. Remember not to include homeowner's insurance and property taxes since you'll still have those in retirement. After losing the 15% mortgage payment, we're now down to a 75% replacement rate. You might also have other expenses during your working years that you won't have in retirement. You won't have to spend as much on clothing, and you won't be commuting to work every day. You may also be spending money on your children today that, hopefully, you won't be spending in retirement. One obvious expense that you won't have is Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes, which are just under 8% of your income. But some expenses go up in retirement. You might want to do more traveling, and later you'll probably have higher health care costs. I think that a good rule of thumb for an income replacement rate is about 65 to 70% of your pre-retirement income. Any more, and you'll be living better in retirement than you did during your working years. If I have more money when I'm 70 than when I'm 50, would I regret not giving the 50-year-old a few extra bucks to go on a family vacation? So what's it going to cost to replace 70% of your income? If your income was $100,000, then you'll want about $70,000 per year. Subtract $20,000 that you'll get from Social Security and maybe $10,000 from an old pension, and you have $40,000 per year that you need to make up through retirement savings. You can see from this calculation that workers who live on a more modest income don't need to save as much for retirement to smooth their spending. If you're earning $30,000 per year and plan to replace 70% of that amount, then you'll only need $21,000 per year in retirement. Social Security is going to cover a big percentage of that amount. Add on a pension, and you may not need to save much for retirement other than to protect against the unexpected health expenses. But if you earn $200,000 before retirement and want to replace 70% of your income, you're going to need to save a lot more. How much do you need to save? What is your number? There are a few rules that financial experts use to estimate how much you need to save to generate a dollar of retirement income. But first, you need to understand that there are two basic sources of funds that most people draw on in retirement. One is their investments, 
The other is annuities. If you plan to spend money from your investments, then many financial advisors suggest basing your plans on what's known as the 4% rule. The 4% rule is based on research that estimates a safe withdrawal rate using historical investment return data. According to these studies, a retiree can withdraw about 4% of their investments each year adjusted for inflation and be reasonably certain that they won't run out of money after 30 years if they start at age 65. For example, with a million dollars, you can live on $40,000 the first year. If inflation is 2.5%, then you spend $41,000 the next year. So you spend a little more each year to maintain your lifestyle throughout retirement. The arithmetic changes if you wait a few years to retire. First, each year you defer Social Security, you get a bigger paycheck, about 8% increase per year. A worker making $50,000 per year will get about $20,000 at full retirement age, which is 66 right now, depending on when you were born. If they instead claim Social Security at age 62, they'd only get about $15,000 per year. If they claimed at 70, their Social Security check would go up to $27,000 a year. And unlike a lot of pensions, a Social Security check goes up each year with inflation. Claiming it later is a very valuable retirement income strategy. Even if you retire earlier, you can live off of your savings for a few years and still claim Social Security when you're older in order to get a higher payment. Also, by retiring a year later, you have one less year of expected longevity. For example, a male retiring at age 65 can expect to live another 20 years. If he retires at 70, he'll live on average another 15 years in retirement. Add on a little over five years for joint mortality for a couple. Since you save in order to cover these years of spending, you'll have to save less. If you haven't saved enough for retirement, your best option is probably just to wait a few years. You can save a little more and you'll need a lot less. Now the other option for ensuring that you'll have enough funds in retirement is to buy a private annuity. Buying a fixed immediate annuity is just like buying your own pension or a bigger social security check. It's an insurance company's guarantee to provide an income each month from now until you die. Annuitizing part of your retirement wealth is the easiest way to create a stable income in retirement. Most economists believe that retirees would be better off annuitizing a big chunk of their retirement savings rather than withdrawing money from savings every year. At this stage, I'm going to raise a big warning flag. Annuities are some of the most abused financial products in the business. Fixed annuities may be a viable option, but I have a problem with variable annuities. Variable annuities are investment accounts that allow people who may have exhausted other tax-sheltered savings options. Money in these accounts is invested in mutual funds, and the value can go up or down based on the market. But very few of these accounts are actually annuitized, and companies can impose big penalties if you try to sell the variable annuity a few years later. They often have high fees and can be very complicated. Very few financial experts can confidently choose a good variable annuity product. Until the industry standardizes these products and provides, provides a way for consumers to compare fees, I don't recommend that anyone buy a variable annuity. Look for fixed annuities only and shop around to make sure you get a competitive income quote. This is a shame because these products could be valuable. In fact, many teachers have access to a very good variable annuity in one of their retirement accounts, but it's just too easy to buy the wrong product right now. Whether you buy an annuity or use the 4% rule, for every dollar above your pensions and social security that you want to be able to spend per year in retirement, you need to save $25 if you retire at age 65. 
by retiring closer to 70, you can lower this to perhaps $20. In our previous example, we estimated a need of about $40,000 each year in order to smooth spending in retirement. Multiplying 25 by $40,000 means that our retirement savings goal is a million dollars. This sounds like a lot of money, and it is. It also gives you an idea of the value of a pension. Each $40,000 of inflation-protected annual pension income is worth about a million dollars. The lucky employee with an $80,000 pension with a cost of living adjustment will live about as well as someone with $2 million in their 401k. Saving 25 times your income needs is being conservative. Some would say too conservative. Studies of retirement spending do show that we tend to spend less as we, get, as we get older. This makes sense since we tend to be most active during the first decade of retirement. Generally, spending declines in our late 70s and 80s and only increases if we experience a negative health event. Long-term care costs are only covered by Medicare for the first 20 days and up to $140 per day for the next 80 days. After that, you're on the hook until you run out of money. Then you become eligible for Medicaid. This can be a frightening prospect since long-term care costs are over $80,000 a year in the United States. However, once you move into a long-term care facility, you generally don't have significant non-health-related expenses. So if you are already getting Social Security and a small pension covering, say, half of those costs, you may choose to cover the remaining $40,000 from savings and home equity. The alternative is to buy long-term care insurance, which is generally very expensive. In the risk management lecture, I mentioned that it makes sense to buy insurance for low probability events. Since so many will eventually pay some long-term care expenses, insurance may not be the most efficient way to deal with this risk. There's a lot of debate among economists on the value of long-term care insurance right now. Now that we understand how much it will cost to provide enough retirement income, let's go over some investing basics. Whether you work for a company or you're self-employed, you have the option of investing in a 401k. As I mentioned before, the great thing about a 401k is that you won't have to pay any taxes on investment earnings until retirement. So no taxes on dividends, interest, or capital gains. This is a big savings. The government estimates that it loses about $60 billion a year in tax revenue from sheltered retirement plans. What's bad about 401ks? It's how people use them. The first problem is that most Americans don't save enough. Amazingly, many Americans don't take advantage of an employer match. With a match, the company will chip in the same amount of money that you put into a 401k up to a percentage of your income. It's free money. There's no strings attached. Your employer is leaving you $100 bills on the ground, and all you have to do is pick them up by going to the benefits office and filling out a form to contribute to your 401k. If you're like most Americans, you need to increase the amount that goes into your 401k. Young or low-income workers might only need to save 5 or 6 percent, but most middle-aged workers should be saving twice that amount or more once kids become independent and housing expenses fall. In general, your contribution rate should rise over time. In fact, one easy strategy is to increase your 401k contributions by half of your annual raise, and then you'll never notice it. When you do decide to contribute to a 401k, you'll need to choose how to invest. The default investment is generally going to be something known as a target date fund. It's called a target date fund because it has a target retirement day, say 2030. The idea behind this type of investment is that it does everything pretty well. 
It is a diversified mix of stocks and bonds. It rebalances automatically when stocks go up or down in value, and it gradually moves toward a higher percentage of bonds as you get older. So you're not as vulnerable to a market crash right before retirement. I really like target date funds, but the most important characteristic of them is the expense ratio. When someone asks me how to invest their retirement funds, my answer is to choose the lowest expense ratio target date fund. If they're the kind of person who will freak out when their portfolio loses money, I'll recommend choosing a target date that isn't so far away. For example, a 2020 target date fund will have more bonds and less stocks than a 2040 target date fund. Target date funds make choosing a retirement portfolio incredibly easy. Just make sure you choose one with the lowest fees. Even a well-designed target date fund becomes unattractive if it's too expensive. If your target date fund has a very high expense ratio, say 1.2%, and you can invest in a stock and bond index fund that has an expense ratio of 0.2%, then just go with the less costly index funds. If you go this route, check your portfolio every year and sell some stocks or bonds so that the percentage of each matches your willingness to take risks. If you've decided that you want a 50-50 mix of stocks and bonds and stocks went up by 25% this year, then sell some of the stock funds and use the money to buy some more of the bond fund. That's how you rebalance. As retirement approaches, just reduce your percentage of stocks and increase your percentage of bonds. Another way to shelter investments from taxes is in an individual retirement account, or an IRA. The difference between an IRA and a 401k is that I can choose to invest through an IRA wherever I want, not just in the options that are available through my employer. Another advantage is that I can aggregate all of my 401k accounts from old jobs into one single retirement account. You've got to open up the IRA first. Choose an investment company that offers low fee investment options. Then you'll need to fill out a rollover form to transfer retirement savings into an IRA. Make sure you get somebody to help you and never have the 401k company send you a check because if you do, you'll be taxed on the amount of the check as if you had withdrawn it. Just transfer the funds directly from one tax sheltered account to another. One reason you might not want to roll your 401k funds into an IRA is that many employer retirement accounts already offer low expense ratio mutual funds. In this case, the rollover only makes sense if it's more convenient to have all of your money in one place. If, however, your 401k fund's expenses are higher than those in your IRA, then rolling over the funds into an IRA is really a no-brainer. And be aware that many professionals who call themselves financial advisors will want you to roll your retirement accounts into an IRA that may be more expensive than your, than your employer's 401k. This is becoming a big problem in the investment industry since many of these advisors do not have to make investment recommendations that are in your best interest. Be careful that the funds that you move into are less costly than the funds offered by your employer. In the last lecture, I'll cover how to choose an investment advisor. If you're self-employed, you can open up your own 401k. In essence, you are your own employer so you can create a 401k at an investment company and invest the money yourself. There are other options such as self-employed pensions or SEPs. This lets you shelter a quarter of your self-employed income. Whether you're self-employed or an employee, you can contribute to an IRA if your adjusted gross income or AGI is about $100,000 for a married couple or about $60,000 for a single. The contribution limit is pretty low, only a little over $5,000 a year per person, or about $1,000 more if you're age 50 or older. An IRA contribution is just like a contribution to a 401k. It reduces your taxable income for that year. 
If you've already contributed up to the match at work and are considering either putting money into a 401k or putting it into an IRA, invest wherever the fund options have the lowest expense ratio. Many large employers have low cost investment options, but many smaller employers do not. Let's take a minute to talk about the Roth IRA. During my education lecture, I mentioned that I had no idea why the government made their system of tax incentives so ridiculously difficult to understand. In 1997, we added a new, completely different kind of IRA named after Republican Senator William Roth of Delaware. The benefits of a Roth IRA are backloaded. They mainly occur in the future. Unlike a traditional IRA, you do not get to deduct the amount invested in a Roth from your income today. So your contribution is taxable today. Let's say you want to put $5,000 into retirement savings and are in the 30% tax bracket. If you contribute $5,000 to a traditional IRA, you'll save 30% or $1,500 on your federal income tax bill. If you contribute $5,000 to a Roth, you won't get any savings today. But when you take the money out, you won't owe any taxes. You will have to pay income taxes when you take money out of your traditional IRA or your 401k. Mathematically, it works, it works out the same if you pay the same federal income taxes before and after retirement. Both types of IRAs are sheltered from taxes over time. In any type of sheltered retirement account, you can take the money out without penalties starting at age 59 and a half. Seriously, 59 years and six months. Don't ask me why. But with a traditional IRA or a 401k, you have to begin taking money out of the account at age 70 and a half. That's so that the government can be sure that you'll pay tax on the money eventually. They let you shelter it from taxes, but you have to pay the piper. The money you have to take out of, a, out of a retirement account is called a required minimum distribution, or an RMD. It's a percentage of your total savings based on expected longevity. You can look up the table online. You'll pay income taxes on the RMD. You can do whatever you want with the money. You can spend it, or you can put it back into an investment account. But you do have to pay income taxes. With a Roth IRA, you don't have any RMDs. You can keep sheltering the money as long as you like. You can choose when and how much to take out, and you don't have to pay taxes on what you take out after age 59 and a half. This is a big advantage of a Roth, and one of the reasons I prefer saving in a Roth to saving in a conventional IRA. I also like knowing that I'm protected against increases in future tax rates. Moreover, Roths have income limits that are nearly twice as high as traditional IRAs, so upper middle class households that are no longer eligible to contribute to an IRA could put money into a Roth. You can roll traditional 401k money into a Roth, but you'll need to pay income taxes today. If you have a year where, where taxable income is temporarily low, say if you've just retired or spent a few months out of the job market, that can be a good time to do a Roth conversion. Now that we know how much money we'll need in retirement and how to invest, we'll need to figure out how much of our income we'll have to save in order to meet our retirement goal. In a recent research project, we found that those who use a computer program to calculate how much they'll need to save for retirement end up saving more. Why? Because I think we often underestimate how much we'll need to save each month in order to meet our goals. Let's assume we're 42, haven't saved anything for retirement, and want to retire at age 67. Using the payment function in Excel and plugging in a million dollar goal with a 5% after inflation interest rate and a 25 year time horizon, we find that you'd need to save almost $1,700 per month. That may be too much of most households' budgets, but it is reality. And if that much savings won't fit into your budget, then you really have two choices. You can retire later, or you can spend less in retirement. 
Life cycle savings is all about balancing spending today and spending in the future. And that's exactly what workers do when they decide how much to save for retirement. If you can meet your spending needs with a replacement rate of 60%, that is, if you can live comfortably in retirement on 60% of your current adjusted gross income, we can cut a quarter million dollars from the million dollar retirement savings goal. Another option is to simply retire later. Retiring at 70 has two benefits. We have an additional three years of savings and our life expectancy is three years less. Three more years lets us save $300 less per month in order to meet the million dollar goal. It'll also cost less to buy a dollar of annual retirement income, so we won't need a million dollars. We'll also get about $150 more every month from Social Security by claiming benefits three years later. With the same 70% replacement rate, retiring at 70 instead of 67 means we can spend $550 more per month now and still smooth consumption at retirement. Remember that we all have a retirement plan. If we plan to do nothing or to start saving tomorrow, then we won't have a very large number when we retire. The average American has about $100,000 in their 401k right before retirement. That's only enough to buy them an income of about $350 per month above Social Security. But most of us want a better retirement than that. I hope you've seen today that building your own retirement income plan isn't actually that hard. Estimate a goal amount based on a sensible income replacement rate and save enough each month to meet that goal in low expense ratio tax sheltered accounts. But the single most important predictor of retirement success is whether you start saving in the first place. Don't be intimidated by the number of investment options or coming up with the right savings rate. Keeping it simple really is the best strategy.